And now I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Ryan. All right, thank you, Arnfin. Uh, this is a real uh, pleasure to be here. I attend all of these, so it's, uh, it's fun to be on this side of it and hopefully give back to the community. Uh, so this is Leveling Up, a KCS program. I am Ryan Matthews, Director of Digital Support here at NetApp. I report in through the Customer Support Organization as well as the Customer Experience Office. I have with me our digital support team. So uh, James Askew leads our uh, support site team. Uh, Drew Claybrook is our community manager and, and leads the uh, the peer-to-peer -peer support channel for us. Uh, Padma Prasad and, uh, leads the, the KB team, or, or and we like to call her uh, team, the Evolve Loop Programs team, which will resonate with this group uh, because they do so much more than just KB. Uh, and then we've got Raya Prolo, uh, Suri Narayana. That's a mouthful. We call him RVS for short. Uh, to KCS, I guess his name, <laughs> but he does the integrated uh, KCS solution, integrating uh, our KB into our case management system. So as I roll through, if you guys have questions, they'll be monitoring chat and we'll, we'll certainly jump in and answer them as quick as we can. And then at the end, I'll certainly leave time for, for any open questions. So with that, let's, let's jump into it. So obviously uh, it's a pandemic. Everybody's looking for good content. And I'm a big fan of podcasts, uh, especially when I watch my son play soccer. It's great to be able to do that at the same time. And one of my favorite podcasts is uh, No Stupid Questions, co-hosted by Stephen Dubner and Angela Duckworth. Stephen Dubner is famous for his work on Freakonomics. The No Stupid Questions uh, podcast is part of the Freakonomics radio network. He's fantastic. And then he partners with Angela Duckworth, who is famous for her work with Grit. She's a behavioral psychologist. And in particular, I'll reference you back to a November 15th podcast edition where they took on uh, two questions. And one question was, why is behavior change so darn hard? And I think that's something that would resonate very well with um, KCS practitioners around the world, because at the end of the day, um, you're always teetering on the edge of making sure that your teams are doing the right things and you can get the benefit of KCS. And so as I listened to it, um, what, what really... I took away is that there's some science behind change management and Angela is the absolute uh, expert at that. And anything she talks about, it's always coming from a behavioral change, uh, scientific approach as a behavioral psychologist. And, and I think that, you know, what, what she really uh, spoke to me in this particular conversation is that uh, she's got, her research has 13 commandments of change management in which she puts into three groups. In the first group, she talks about promoting forces and restraining forces. And traditionally, you know, we put a lot of stock and focus in promoting forces. These are things like eat your fruits and vegetables, get a good night's sleep, exercise, and you will live a healthier life. And we all know that to be true. But at the same time, <clears throat> we have to put this in context of making it easy, right? And sometimes it's pretty easy to grab that, you know, late night, um, uh, ice cream bowl or chips and stuff if you're on a diet. And so we need to think about the level of effort and how it correlates to our behavior. And, and this was really championed by Kurt Lewin in the early 20th century with his work that Angela talks about. And, and she encourages us to think about this almost like vector math. So if your promoting force is the, represented by the blue arrow, and it's largely outnumbered by this big red restraining force, inevitably, it's going to be difficult for people to do the right thing. And so part of our focus today is going to be highlighting, exposing, and attacking restraining forces. And a great example of this is, you know, Amazon, right? They have one-click buying. What have they done there? They've completely made it easy for you to buy the next thing on Amazon. And so they've focused heavily on restraining forces. And I think a lot of tech companies have done this, and, and it's why, uh, you know, mobile phones are so attached to, to our consciousness. But you have to balance. I'm not saying you don't do promoting forces, but I think you're largely – better off focusing on restraining forces. I took the rest of the grouping that Angela talks about and turned it into our agenda. And the idea here was in true KCS fashion, I wanted to tease out the reusable bits of our discussion today. Uh, and NetApp will certainly be the context and I'll give you, uh, you know, insight into our, our journey with KCS. But in particular, I wanted to bring out the reusable bits so you could bring it back to your KCS programs and you can put it in your inventory and use it. And that's really this, it's lower effort, it's nudge. Now, Angela uh, Duckworth talked about shoving. So nudging or shoving, it's up to you. Um, and then building and managing momentum. And I think you have to do all three in order to be successful long-term. Uh, and this is really what the science of change management is behind it. I'll also go into a little bit about leveling and what I mean by that in terms of the adoption guide. 
So real quick, uh, NetApp at a glance, we're an industry leading storage systems and software company. Also have an industry leading cloud data services offer. Many of you are probably customers of NetApp and we thank you very much for those of you who aren't. We, we look forward to serving you one day if we can. Uh, we were founded in 1992 as Network Appliance, uh, championing the idea of network attached storage. Uh, in Sunnyvale, California. That remains our headquarters, and we've shortened the name over the years to NetApp. We've got about 38,000 customers around the world, more than 10,000 uh, employees, more than 5,000 partners, 98 offices, and we got a lot going on, and it's a great place to work. I lead the digital support team here at NetApp. I've got 20 years in technology services and support. Uh, about half of that's actually working with KCS, both certified in version five and now version six. And when there's a version seven, I'll be certified in that too. I am a true believer. And I've had an opportunity to use KCS and lead KCS programs in many different uh, areas and arenas. And actually I've, I've championed my career in looking for opportunities to do that. Uh, I've used it in B2B and B2C, a small, medium and large company, uh, a SaaS solution, a traditional product solution, a startup company, a mature company, during an acquisition. I've used it in Salesforce. I've used it in Zendesk. I've used it in MindTouch. I've used it with Caveo, Ativio Search. I've led two new KCS adoptions, uh, both on V5 and V6. And this is the first opportunity when I joined NetApp about two and a half years ago to reboot an existing KCS practice. Um, at the end of the day, what the takeaway there is, is, I, you know, KCS works. If it can, any, there's very few things that would work in all those environments and KCS is one of them. And, and I am a testament to that. And I know that uh, I'm speaking to a group of advocates that agree with that. All right. So on to point number one, lowering effort. And, you know, one thing that uh, I really took in and when I joined NetApp uh, two and a half years ago is that we had an incredible customer experience. It had just a tremendous amount of utility. If I looked at it, I had more utility and more assets at my disposal at NetApp than I'd ever had before. And it was truly amazing. But as I studied it, what I started to find out is that we took a lot of that utility that we had built into the customer experience and we were borrowing it. We were bringing it into our support engineers. And so the takeaway for me was that we really weren't managing a single experience. We were, or we weren't managed to an experience. We were managing one. We had we combined them so much that you really couldn't separate them. And I think that was a mistake. I think at the end of the day, these are two different experiences. And we got to talking about it as a team. And I said, you know, from a concept perspective, a better engineer experience is a better customer experience. You know, we don't have to worry about the, the connective tissue there, because if we invest in our support engineers and make it easy for them to do their job, they will do it well and serve our customers better. Um, so, namely, if we, if we invest in our customer experience, you know, that doesn't mean that we need to borrow from it to enrich our support experience. These can be two different investment strategies. These can be two different development strategies. And I think they should be, because I think when you combine them, inadvertently you introduce a lot of restraining forces and I'm going to talk about that. So the first thing you got to do I think is look at this and manage two different unique experiences and I like to think about them as two sides of the same coin right they are not mutually exclusive there is connection between there is correlation but they are unique and it's a mistake to, to, to not treat them that way. Uh, in the case management front, we wanted to reduce friction, we want to integrate knowledge, and we wanted to make it fast and purpose-built. We spent a, a lot of time with, with David Kay of DBK and Associates, and you know, he has a great analogy there about building a race car. Um, and if, if those of you who know David, you know he's passionate about racing, and racing is all about going fast and being lightweight and not having creature comforts. And so your support engineers need an environment that's built like that, right? They, they don't need creature comforts all the time. Sometimes it's a, what they need is the answers to move quickly. And that's what we did. We built an environment for our support engineers that was, that was purpose-built for their activities. Same thing with our customers. We want creature comforts there, right? We want air conditioning. We want heated seats. We want to take care of them. We want them to come back. So it's not all about lean and mean and fast there. Sometimes it's about quality of navigation and insight and opportunity and, and opt-in. The design principles are the same, reduce friction, integrate knowledge and fast and purpose built, but it's for our customers and partners. So first you know, lesson I think from the NetApp experience is don't borrow, it, 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 develop these two experiences uniquely. And I think it'll serve you well. Now, once we identified that design concept, it was really important that we attacked specifically those restraining forces. Remember, it's vector math. And so if you have a big restraining force there and you make it difficult to do the right thing, your engineers will struggle to get it done. 
And so really go after it. And I think this was a huge advantage in terms of uh, an approach in rebooting a program because it allowed me not to just point fingers and say, hey, look, this is not the way you do KCS and point blame and, and get into a kind of a negative conversation. It really flipped the script. It said, hey, you know, help us help you identify the things that are blocking your ability to do KCS the right way. And, and they helped us, right? So our team and Padma's uh, team led this charge. They partnered with our support teams and they got together and we built five minute videos and it has to be short, right? Five minutes or less. And dare I say they are propaganda videos because you have an agenda and your idea is to influence. And a lot of times you're trying to influence decision makers that don't spend every day in a support engineer's world. So they don't know how difficult it is for them to do the right thing. And so you want to bring video in there because seeing is believing and make them five minutes or less. So it's they're consumable and have an agenda, have a bone to pick. Actually the enemy is restraining forces and this is how you go after them, right? So identify the restraining forces in that support engineer experience. Talk about clicks and screen pops and anywhere where the human is, is human duct tape, right? Between systems, that's your target and really expose it. And, and if you do it, I think people will come along to your line of thinking and say, wow, we're making it way too hard for our team. Your team will be in, incredibly thankful because you're advocating for making the world better, making their job easier. And at the end of the day, you're going to build a lot of consensus that something needs to be done. Now, it's not enough just to point out problems. Everybody can point out problems. It's easy to point out problems. What's difficult is proposing solutions. And I, for one, am a huge fan of the KCS Academy and the consortium's work on building KCS verified aligned tools. Uh, they've got a great inventory. Uh, I've got a couple examples that we brought into NetApp that have been absolutely tremendous. Mind touch with our KB site, uh, David Kay and Jennifer Crippen at DBK and Associates have been Marvelous. I'm a huge fan of the Align services because they can help you in so many different ways and so many different uh, spots inside and outside your, your organization. Um, and then, you know, this is a journey that's long term, right? And you have to not be defeatist if you don't get your way right away. We just deployed Caveo on Friday evening. Um, and we've been talking about it for, for over a year. So, um, you know, use this, this package of verified and aligned services to good effect, because I think it helps you know, information architects or IT teams or people that aren't necessarily familiar with what's out there. They've got, you know, vendors and offers at different price points and different specialities. So find one that works for you and make it a pitch. And again, if you want to do KCS the right way, doesn't it make sense to have your tools and your consultants and everybody know kind of the methodology too? I think it does. All right. So at this point, you're developing two different experiences. You're targeting restraining forces. You're doing the effort mass. You're getting people on your side, and it's important that you don't skip design. Remember, I told you that NetApp had just some tremendous utility, but we had too much utility. We didn't have enough human elements. And so I think the best way to do this is when you destruct your experiences and you build them back up, it's to do it with a user-centered design. Actually build it for humans and make humans the target of, of your good work and your investment. And so on the internal side, uh, we worked with, with David Kay and we figured out how to build that purpose-built race car that does KCS V6 the right way and lets our engineers move at the speed of conversation, right? Throw in any KCS buzzword you want here. That's what you're targeting, right? That's, that's the end, working with the end in mind. And so what was great here is it forced our internal IT teams to actually do a user-centered design for our users. I mean, they treated them like customers, paying customers. And this was a first for our team. Most of the internal tools, that was all about feature functionality. It wasn't about humans. And we forced them to treat them like paying customers. And it was amazing to watch them rise to that occasion and deliver a, a good environment to our, to our engineers, one that, that, you know, essentially paying customers would pay for. I think the other insight here is that, you know, most uh, programs, whether you're adopting new or you're uh, rebooting a program, you have existing assets externally on the self-service site. It's not enough for you to just leave that be and atrophy while you work inside out. You also don't want to work outside in because then you're going to have a content problem. So I think you need to work both at the same time. And that's what we did here is we, we engaged uh, Francois Charnier and her FT Works team, again, to work with, with our internal teams to build a world-class support site experience. 
And we did this in parallel. And oh, by the way, we did it in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there was a lot going on and it was crazy, but it was the right thing to do because you have to manage that external self-service site. You have to make it better. People want to see continual improvement. You cannot let this languish. So you have to work inside out, outside in and do it at the same time. Bring in third party if you can afford it to give you unbiased and, and truthful uh, assessments of what the industry is doing and the experience that you need to strive for. And most importantly, do it for humans. User-centered design is all about iteration and usability testing and, and fast failing and doing quick prototyping. And that's the best way that if you're going to spend a lot of time removing restraining forces, don't let them back in. And, and you, the way you don't let them back in is through user-centered design. I've got a couple of our uh, URLs here. You can check out our sites for our support site, our KB site, and our community site. Um, would encourage any feedback that you have on them, uh, but, but they're living, breathing entities. So if you check back in six months, I promise you they'll be better than they are today. All right, so point number two. Um, this is around nudging. Maybe you got to shove sometimes, and it just depends on how nice a person you are or what your environment you find. Uh, but the second point of leveling up is about nudging. And, and this is, you know, uh, again, unique, I think, to rebooting a program. If you're rolling out KCS for the first time, the adoption guide makes a lot of sense, right? It's projects, uh, it's phases. Uh, it, it, but the problem is you need to make sure your team knows this is not an event. It cannot be an event because the goal here is to get to phase four maximization and stay there. Now, when you look at an existing program, and we've done KCS here at NetApp for many years. Um, so did it make sense intuitively if I came in and said, all right, we need to do an adoption? Absolutely not. I needed to frame that up. And the way that I framed it up is I said, you know, the goal here is to put KCS in our, in our DNA. And I think it's best to think about the adoption guide as a lifestyle, not a project. This is not about, this is not an event. We're not going anywhere. And so the goal here is to think about the phases more as levels and you earn your way. And the goal here, again, is to earn our way to level four and stay there. And if we can sustain it, we will stay there. But if we can't sustain it, if that change that we work so hard to put in place and the systems that we work so hard to make uh, work the way we want them to, if they start to fail us, we will come back down the ladder. And that's what's essentially happened here. So rather than point fingers or worry about, you know, are you doing real KCS or you're doing not, you know, not doing cases, we just said, no, let's look at the adoption guide as a maturity assessment vehicle and say, where do we fit? If we use the exit criteria of these phases, what are we able to uh, say that we, we do today? And what we found is that after that self-assessment, we were a level two organization. And it allowed some time and space for, for self-reflection and say, okay, if we want to be a level four organization, we have to get together and not put a plan together that's time bound, but put it together that was on objective criteria that's listed in, in you know, essentially phase two and phase three and figure out how we climb this ladder. And it was an amazing moment because I think that the team really embraced this idea of, okay, you know, we've done KCS for many years. This is an opportunity to do it different. We're going to really align to V6 principles and we're going to climb the ladder. And we're going to use this as a way for us, not only to climb the ladder the right way, but in a way that we can sustain operations in level four for in perpetuity. And that's all, our ultimate goal. We, we see level four as the, ex, the service excellence that it is. I think we buy into the consortium concept that knowledge is the great enabler and we aim to be a level four organization. And, and by the way, I think this is a plug for version seven that we should consider leveling for the adoption guide. I think this is uh, incredibly powerful for not only new adoptions, but programs that may be trying to, to retool and refine that have done KCS for many years. All right, so another nudge in the, in the direction you wanna go is once you've identified service excellence and said we're gonna use the adoption guide as a lifestyle, uh, we need to invest in mastery. And this was pretty obvious to me because when I came in and I asked uh, people around the, the globe what KCS was and how it worked, I got a different answer every time. And so we need to really set our standard very high and come to some agreement on what KCS was. And the best way to do this, I think, is the KCS V6 practices certification. I, I like to say it's like Red Bull. It gives you wings. I am a product of that. Padma, James, Drew, RVS are all a product of that, and our entire KCS council. Um, we put a line in the sand that said, we're going to establish a, a KCS council, and everybody's going to be certified to the highest uh, certification accreditation that KCS offers. And we, we 
reached out to David Kay and said, you know, you helped us to build this great technology stack internally for our team. We want you to start working with our, our team on a, on a human level. And we, we put a, a call out before COVID. So we were able to do it in person, fortunately, but you can do this virtually. Um, we said, everybody's going to come in. And at the end of the week, you're going to take the certification uh, exam. And I believe that every single one of our members of our KCS Council who represent every single one of our work centers around the world came in and could have passed that test on day one. Um, and so imagine the fruitful conversations that if you're ready to pass this certification test on day one of a workshop, and then you have four days to work with the best in the business to talk about KCS principles and David K. Imagine how um, powerful a, a workshop that is. And I, David told me at the end, it was the highest um, passing rate that he's ever had. We basically had everybody pass uh, at the end of the, the, the week. And so this was a huge shot in the arm. I mean, it was a massive nudge in the direction we wanted to go because no longer did I have to explain KCS or worry about a different definition of KCS eking into our program. It was the same and it was at the highest standards. And this global team of teams led other teams and it really just lifted uh, the, 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 you know, the, they say rising tide lifts all boats. I mean, that's what this was. And it was all off the back of our, our KCS council. We then parlayed that momentum into uh, training for our, our coaches, training for our leadership teams, and so on and so forth. And so it really led uh, the resurgence of our KCS practices to set that standard high, use the certification workshop as something that uh, we were a platform to work off of. And it, it was an incredible boost to our program. And, and we thank David Kay and, and, and his work. And then follow-ons uh, work with, with Jennifer Crippen as we brought people into the council that missed that initial workshop. All right, this is a shove and this is a big deal, right? So anything in nature that's static is dying or dead. And you need to think about your KB site in this light. Stable systems are not static. Stable systems have movement and, and there's a dynamism to them and static is dead or dying. And unfortunately, our content in the KB was static. Uh, there wasn't enough create, there wasn't enough improvement that was commensurate with the flow of cases that were coming into assisted support. So we needed to shock the system. And you have to be brave here because if your system is static and you keep it in place, it'll continue to be static and it'll be difficult for you to break into that momentum. So you, you figure out a way to shock the system. Now, in our particular experience, to make a sport engineer experience better, we elected to move KB. So we were moving to MindTouch and MindTouch has been an incredible uh, boost for our program because of the ease at which it allows the support engineers to KCS V6 the right way. So we had a decision and we elected and I'll be frank, it was one of the hardest professional decisions I've ever been a part of and it was risky, but we elected not to migrate over 25,000 articles in our new KB. And so think about that. We're going to move forward to sustain operations for a Fortune 500 company like NetApp with hundreds of thousands of viewers, and we were going to not migrate a KB. It sounds crazy. Everybody thought we were crazy, but this is why. We knew that it was too static, and we had to shock the system. And so what we decided to do is set the self-service site and read only. We didn't create, we didn't update, we didn't improve, we did nothing to the KB for three months while we built up internally. That was actually the first sign that we had made the right decision. Do you know, I, I didn't get one complaint, not one, for the KB not being updated in three months. That, that's what let me know that this KB was dying. It was atrophying every day. So we could have sustained that, we could have maintained it. It would have been the easy decision, but it would have been the wrong one long-term. And so I'm proud of our team for backing this and committing to it. And, and making the hard choice. Now, if you take a decision like that on, it, you have created an environment for a hero to emerge. Because trust me, if I said, you know, hey, Padma or James or Drew or anybody in our KCS council or sport engineers, no one person, no 10 people are solving that problem for you, right? You, you, you have now, you are absolutely requiring the entire all hands on deck situation, right? And that's the true power of KCS. And so don't run from this, embrace it. I think this is a great nudge in the right direction because it's, it, it embraces the power of the collective. Like we're not getting out of this together once we made this choices um, it, or one by one. We, we, the only way out of this is together, right? And so the people rally behind this and we made the hero of our KCS program, the publisher. And what's great about this is a licensed publisher could be a coach, could be a sport manager, could be a member of the KCS council, 
it could be a KCS vet like me, or it could be somebody brand new to KCS. We were all publishers. And so it put this faceless, nameless hero at the forefront that we all had a part of. And we had to look at our processes because if this was our hero and this is who we were banking on and this is who we were believing in, we had to look at our processes and say, look, if the power of the collective matters, then we have to stop making it seem like elements of the KB are more important than the entire KB. And so we were sending feedback back to the original creator way too much. And think about that. It sends a signal to the, the publisher, hey, the KB all matters, but the things you created originally matter more. And, and there, we had a few processes like that that were undermining this idea of the power of the collective. And so we backed those off. We said, look, we're all in this together. You know, when you create an article, if you do the solve route the right way, it's, it's, a, it's a reflex option, right? You, you can't control the opportunity that's presented to you. All that you can control is the judgment and the choice to create, improve, or maybe you do nothing. All of these are, are valid choices but you're in charge of it and you're not controlling what you're putting in the KB. So therefore stop worrying about the things you create originally and start worrying about the collective health of the KB. And I think this took a little while to resonate, but when you combine it with the fact that we weren't going to migrate our content automatically, people got it right. And the hero emerged. So the second area, um, and again, you know, I think this is more than nudge. This is shoving, but um, you have to really get people to drive to resolutions. And, and I call it the sweet sound of KCS, it, it's resolutions. And so, you know, when you look at a dynamics of um, a KB, you have this idea of the, you know, the long neck and the, and the long tail, right? The long neck is your evolve loop content. These are the things that if you look in the KDA guide on the consortium and the KCS Academy sites, it's really that, you know, 20% of content that drives 80% uh, of the views or, or the demand. And you have to address that as well as the long tail. And so we asked our team, look, helpful articles are nice, but the only way that we're gonna build up uh, the relevant articles, get rid of the wall of text, get rid of the old formatting issues that we've seen in our KB is that for on every single case, we have to get to resolution. We have to get to root cause and that will accelerate our path down the, uh, to the new KB, right? And so what we did is we used the solve loop to inject relevancy, that long tail and we asked our engineers to not only link, but link and differentiate helpful from resolved. And so we got a little screen grab here. It's pretty simple, but it makes a huge difference in your coaching program and the quality of content. If you can really cement home for your team, it's helpful is nice. I'm not, I'm not saying reference articles aren't um, a good thing for your KB, but if every single case you get to a resolution and a resolution can come in the form of a reuse, it can come in the form of a create, you know, so on and so forth, even, even not, you know, legitimate non-participation where you elect not to do anything. Um, you know, th those are basically absent a resolution, but, but it's not, you know, it's understood that that wasn't possible, right? That was the right thing to do is to do nothing. And so that focus on resolution is a huge content health decision that you'll have to make. And I really encourage you to think about linking and, and promoting this idea to all the way to resolution, because, uh, it, there's goodness in, in the content health that outcome that, that comes from it, right? So think about the, the deal in terms of long tail and long neck. Now, the long neck in a short period of time like that, we couldn't replicate in the soft loop. And so we had to manually migrate those high demand articles from our old KB, put them through kind of a V6 filter and, and put them in place. And we did this for like less than 5% of the articles. But do you know that most of our team now looks at that as a mistake, Right. They, they say, oh, I wish that content didn't exist in there. And, and it was a necessary component to sustain operations externally. Um, and we did scrub them for our V6 cont content standard that, that obviously got updated in the new KB. But uh, it was a good lesson for us because I don't think the solve loop could do this exclusively. You have to, you have to kind of cherry pick and put some high demand content in there if you're not going to migrate your, your, your content in full. Um, but manage this, right? Manage the dynamic. Look at the long neck, look at the long tail, figure out how you're going to replicate it. And if you do it right and you drive to resolution, you, you can, in a very short period of time, uh, sustain operations externally and breathe uh, you know, life into your program. All right. So we've talked about uh, restraining forces. We've talked about nudging and maybe a little bit of shoving. And now it's all about momentum, right? Momentum is seeing it, feeling it, being a part of something bigger than yourself, and giving into uh, 
giving into that feeling, right? And so I, I showed you this badge of honor concept that we developed for our publisher. And, and this was a full blown license. Uh, we had a lot of fun with this, but KCS has got to be earned, right? It's not given. So you had to earn your, your publisher license and that was kind of your gateway. And then we had people step up to be a coach and, you know, they knew UFA, uh, they, they embraced it, they learned it, but they wanted to do more. And so we asked our coaches to be the purveyor of our, our solve loop. And so their, their, their marching orders were solve loop relentlessly, right? This is a never ending task. This is something that we want to be super efficient with. And we see as the lifeblood of our program, because we want that long tail to be as long as it possibly can be and, and as good as it can be. And so we ask our coaches to super focus on that. They've got a great, you know, an, an infinite loop there of solve loop relentlessly. Um, our KDs kind of polish the net. So you see in the publisher icon, it was like we cast a wide net, they build the long tail and then the KDs come along and they, and they, they, uh, you know, it's kind of like Charlotte's web, right? They take the net and they, they start to polish it and make it look nice. Um, and, and so their, their charter is to create, resolve and evolve. That's kind of part of the, the big four KCS uh, principles there. Uh, rewarding learning and sharing is the only one we don't listed, but I, I, I know you guys know that. And then lastly, you know, we have our program badge that represents our KCS council. You can see the KCS V6 triangles in there, uh, but with the net app blue. And that was a, a message to our team that we want to align as close as possible to the methodology and do it uh, the best practices uh, at NetApp as best we can. Just to give you some size, size and scope comparison, we had about 500 licensed publishers in wave one and two. Um, again, this is a rebooting of the program. So think about the humility um, and the commitment to excellence that the team showed by going through an adoption and leveling up our program, even though they've done did KCS for many years, right? And so you always have to be willing to continually improve and maybe go back to the basics. And I was really proud of the team for, for doing this and, and committing to get 500 people to license basically again on something that, that they'd done for many years, but it was different. They knew it was different. We had about a hundred coaches. Uh, we had all of our support leaders get get licensed uh, as a publisher, which was tremendous uh, to, to lead from the front like that. And I couldn't be proud of the, the team. And then I, I told you our entire KCS council was certified. Uh, that number is now above 30. Uh, Padma's entire Evolve Loop programs team does work uh, well above and beyond our, our KCS council. They're entirely certified. So we've really embraced the best practice and that high standard and we encourage to invest in it. And, and we've got future waves on the, on the uh, horizon as we move out. Uh, but this has been a huge momentum builder is just taking this badge of honor concept and we've built, baked it into, you know, different case systems that where they can see this badge. So people are excited about it. And as a result, uh, we built some swag. Everybody loves swag. We've got cups and mugs and snoods, you know, COVID-19 was not enough to slow us down in terms of, uh, um, swag and so you know i think this added a human element too because when we it, we celebrate license um, but as our team dispersed all around the world and you know there's some rural places that people end up going when they're not in major work centers when you ship a uh, kcs swag to their house all around the world they appreciate it and they feel like they're part of something and it builds a lot of momentum and so we got everything kitted we had a personal touch they could pick you know, different apparel items. So, you know, th this is ends up being kind of expensive when you factor in shipping, but the think about all the money that you're spending on systems and training. And I mean, this is kind of all about your people and they really appreciate it. So I think it's worth every penny personally. Um, and I think it, you can have fun with it, even with uh, COVID-19 face covers and stuff like that. All right. Don't forget about the videos. You, you made propaganda videos about restraining forces, uh, make propaganda videos about restraining forces being gone. Go back to that same audience that you were asking for help investment, uh, vesting in your support engineer experience and your customer experience and show them the video is gone. We've got a, a YouTube link that we'll share with you on some of on one of the good uh, propaganda videos that we built, not necessarily the bad ones. Um, but the point here is seeing is believing, right? Go back to the same people and, and celebrate things like, hey, you know, this used to take 10 clicks, but now with mind touch, we can drop into it with one click and, you know, show them how fast search is and show them how many repositories you can bring into the, the space with unified search and show off your KCS swag and, and people enjoying it. So, you know, have fun with it. The videos uh, sometimes are that human element and then you'll be surprised at how much momentum that builds for you. Okay. Another tip is, you know, don't retrench from awards and industry engagement during 
this this period. A lot of people are saying, you know, we're retooling, we're going to back off. D- do the opposite, right? This is where you need feedback the most. And in the last year, we deployed a new support site, a new KB site. Uh, we totally revamped the the community. And oh, by the way, we were named the Association of Support Professionals Best Overall Site in 2020. And we can say that we're a award winning support program four years in a row. And we even have banked one in 2021, earning two silver Stevie awards and a bronze. One of those silver Stevie awards was for our KCS coach program. And so, you know, share the spoils, like go for the award, share the spoils. You would not believe the momentum this builds. We had the president of NetApp send an all employees message about the support site, digital support, and the customer support organization, the customer experience office winning awards. That goes a long way. Salespeople, engineering people, everybody heard it, right? HR people. That's not a topic of conversation typically. It's like what the support team has done. We're the, we're the steady uh, hand that, that helps customers and everybody appreciates us, but it's not about you know, proactive winning of stuff, right? That's not a message they hear all the time. And so we, when you can deliver that to the organization and share the spoils like that, people get excited. They like to be part of winning organizations. So we built a virtual trophy case. You can check that out. We'll share the link. But, but, you know, go for awards. Don't retrench if you're going through retooling because that's the exact wrong time. You want to be out there. You want to be loud and proud and you want to get feedback. I mean, that's the key. So you got to be committed to this, to the industry and, and making sure you understand if you got a problem, know about it and start working on it. All right. Another way to build momentum is to go back to that lifestyle concept, right? Don't forget about the adoption guide, especially if you're, you're rebooting a program because you, you, you made a point. You said, look, we're a level two organization. If you let it die there, then you have no credibility. You got to keep going back to that well. And so I'm really proud of the team. After two years of hard work, uh, we basically spent a whole year on systems and a whole year on people and content. We earned our way out of level two. We are now a level three organization. And I, I, I couldn't be prouder of that journey. We're not a level four organization yet. Uh, that's next up on the to-do list and we're working on it, but it's not a time bound thing, right? We, we have to earn our way. And so after two hard years of, of digging and making better and, and being you know, uh, open to change, we were able to, to make the claim. And we even invited uh, David Kay to our program review and, and presented it to the VP of support, Joe Novak, and said, you know, we believe here's our case, here's our body of evidence, and, and we seek your approval to move to level two. So we made the entire team earn this. And it was really, it was one of the uh, proudest moments of my professional career is watching this transformation happen in front of my eyes because it was intense. Um, this was so much harder. A reboot is so much harder than a traditional uh, adoption because you're not dealing with uh, the legacy you know, stuff, right? Uh, it's everything's new and everybody wants to be a part of it. Uh, this was intense and it just was an incredible attitude by our team, incredible f- performance. And, and quite frankly, the, the impact was incredible. And we'll talk a little bit about that and then I'll take your questions. So here's kind of a year over year comparison to show you the impact that, that the leveling up concept here at NetApp has had. Um, so I'll compare 2019 to 2020. And remember, this is in the middle of a global pandemic. So not exactly the ideal time to be rolling stuff out and, and introducing so many new things, but we made it work. So the first thing is I talked about stasis is dying. Um, you know, our content engine was not firing. And so now our content engine is, and it's accelerating. And so I'm really proud of the team because they earned the 90 zero rule, that 90% share rate, zero time to publish. Um, we, we essentially is a forcing function of embracing KCS v6 verified tool and um, MindTouch's caption manager feature. And we make full use of it. And with our licensing process, if an engineer wants to publish something, it's a click of a button. And so that's an increase of 35% share rate from what we were before. Our time to publish was reduced 43,000 minutes, right? And that's, at this point, I don't even report time to publish anymore because everybody knows we're all licensed and they do it. And so it's really fun to take that off the table. But, uh, you know, I, I do remind them it was a 43,000 minute improvement. Uh, 2019 to 2020 increased our create rate six times. That would make sense because we, you know, basically did migrate the old content. Uh, improvement rate doubled. I think that'll switch this year. Our improvement rate will be so much higher in the create rate less as the knowledge base matures. But it would make sense on our journey that that would take place. And here's a big one. Our link rate increased 70% overall. And of those, we can now differentiate what was helpful from what was resolved. And about 40% were helpful, the other was, was resolved. So 
what's the takeaway? Well, we had 25,000 plus articles. When you had translations on there, it went way up. The quality of that knowledge base, the quality of self-service that that served up to our customers pales in comparison to significantly less. So less is more. Quality is higher here. Um, you know, those 12,000 articles, and it's, it's obviously more now that we're into January and February, but that trajectory and the quality of that content is so much better than it was before. It's not even funny. As a result, we've doubled capacity. We've doubled the amount of support delivery in you know, year over year comparison. Our contact ratio is up 60%. This is a measure of digital support web sessions are one to many and many, many channels divided by every assisted support case that comes in. And so we track this closely. Um, and the idea is that you know, as more and more answers are available and customers are engaging across those digital channels, if we can serve those answers up, they'll keep coming back for more. And that's kind of what's happening, right? Um, it's not that assisted support is you know, going away. It, it's just being used differently. Um, a lot of times we were seeing P1 cases come into assisted support, priority one, you know, severity one, however you call them. Uh, now they're coming in as, as P3s because they're solving the problem initially and they're moving into forensic mode. And so we're seeing more and more support, even though our overall cost for support is, is stayed flat. So People intuitively understand this is a good thing. Um, we needed a financial metric to make it real for them, but from a contact ratio perspective and for this audience, you guys understand, you know, people vote with their clicks and eyeballs and, the, you know, this the, a three channel KCS strategy where you're leveraging peer to peer, one to many and, and, and one to one, uh, you know that you can retire more demand for support than you could if you just simply rad, relied upon assisted support. So to see success up that high was great. Um, our self-service and community success within those channels was up 30 and 60% respectively, and self-service visitors were up 100,000 uh, per month. Now, that's significant because of the size of, of NetApp and our online presence, but, you know, I never, I, I make the team appreciate those numbers. Those, those are significant. People don't come into your website and check out uh, what you're doing unless you burned your way. All right. So, like I said, you need to convert that uh, into an optimization discussion. And I think the best way to do this, and I'm really excited about Arnfin and the, the consortium's work here um, on channel success, but I think cost per answer is a great way to do this. And we're a big believer in that. And we want to participate in the community and the championing of that. And actually, James Askew is an absolute whiz now because we've put him, we've run him through <laughs> the, the rigor of the last two years of developing this. Um, but we look at the, you know, kind of three channels of support, assisted support or self-service and then community and, and social. And there's a fourth with detect and predict, but we basically take that and we convert the contact ratio uh, and customer success measures that we spend and we convert it into a financial term. And we were able to go to our CFO and our CEO and our executive staff and our, our vice president of support and our senior vice president, and all the, the execs in our leadership chain and basically say, look, we're delivering way more support than we were the year before. In fact, we put a cost on per answer, and we believe that we've reduced that cost by 52% by optimizing the engagement across multiple channels of support. And this just ended the deflection discussion. When I walked into NetApp two and a half years ago, it was all about deflection. That's all we really were focused on. That's how we made investment decisions, and we had backed ourselves into a corner. We needed to break out of that, and this is how we did it in the cost per answer uh, discussion because they understood intuitively, oh, we're, we're delivering so much more support than we were before, and look at this impact. And it, it calculates really that the value and the understanding of if you serve everybody in assisted support, what that does, and if you do everybody in self-service and what that does. And so, you know, monetarily, they can they can work through that uh, without being a support professional, without being as close to the program and the, and the concepts as we are. So highly encourage using cost prancer and optimizing your engagement accordingly. Also from a 2019 to 2020 uh, comparison, I love the 85-85 rule. I know it's been uh, shepherd to the retired measurements matter. I've got the link there if you want to remind yourself what it was, but the concept was that 85% of the time you wanted, you know, your sport journey to start online and 85% of the time to be them to be successful. I think Greg Oxton really championed that as the 90, 0, 85, 85 and 70, 30. I love the symmetry. Um, so the 70, 30, we've moved to more of a par idea. Um, but I love the 85, 85 and I already told you about the 90, 0. So those part of our program and we couldn't measure it two years ago. And, and thanks to James and Drew and 
RVS and Padma and their teams, uh, we can now. And we estimate that 98% of the time, digital support is part of our support journey and 54% of the time they're successful. Now we know from industry experts like David Kay that that's actually pretty good for a B2B space in a complex system environment. But we aim to be 85-85. That's what being a level four organization is, uh, is and it's an aspirational goal. And we, we won't give up in, until, we, um, until we, we close it down, right? That, that's something that we'll always shoot for. So I will uh, sum it up here and we'll take any questions you might have. But, but I think here are the key takeaways for leveling up and hopefully you can make use of them. Make it easy. Focus on restraining forces, right? You got to work your engineer experience and your customer experience as two different things and work them simultaneously. You can't wait to work one inside out, outside in. You got to work them at the same time. Build them for humans. Humans are what move the needle here. Uh, sometimes you got to nudge, but, but, but I, I recommend shoving. You know, if you got static or stasis anywhere in your program, you got you to gotta go after it. So adoption is a lifestyle, a lifestyle, excuse me, and uh, sustaining level four is the ultimate goal. And I hope that maybe I've convinced this audience that we can advocate in version seven that those are levels in the adoption guide because I think they make more sense that way. And then, you know, we need to build momentum. Um, you need to manage momentum. And if you do it, it'll accelerate your shift left. Uh, this is the path of least resistance. You don't take, have to tell electricity and water where to go. They, 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 they go where the path of least resistance is. Your customers and your users and your sport engineers will do the same. And so good change management is about unleashing the path of least resistance in the way that you want it to go. So prepare the environment, nudge it, and then let it go. And with that, I'll take any questions you may have. So Ryan, there was one in the chat that came in that uh, we weren't able to answer, and it goes like this. In your experience using both Zendesk and Service Cloud KCS, what were the pros and cons of using each system, and do you prefer one versus the other? Yeah, I think, uh, great question. I, I think everybody's kind of looking for uh, the, the perfect KCS solution that comes in and does all your reporting and does is perfectly integrates with your case management and uh, aligns to your workflow. Um, I don't think that exists personally. I think that it would be beautiful if one day we had an easy button like that and had a perfectly integrated KCS solution. But I think the beauty of it is, you know, um, MindTouch, Salesforce, Zendesk, you know, Right Answers, like you got a lot of options. And so what I think you really need to focus on is obviously if you do case management in Salesforce and Salesforce knowledge is there, you know, that's, that's kind of an easier one to establish and integrate deeply. That doesn't mean you have to. Uh, MindTouch has a really good Salesforce solution. So maybe you do a bit of a bake off and figure out, you know, where those restraining forces are in your operation and where the tool uh, particularly um, can help you overcome it. So I think you have lots of options there, but at the end of the day, you have to build something. So if you're, uh, you got really good developers and your IT team is really good with Salesforce, um, you know, use Salesforce knowledge. Uh, if you're in Zendesk and, and use, you know, Zendesk knowledge and you're there, use that. Um, I think you, you want to focus on the human side of it. I think there were things that Salesforce did really well um, it was, you know, gave you all kinds of options to deliver it externally. Um, I love the, the ease of, of editing and, and Zendesk. I mean, so I think they all have positives. They all have uh, some negatives. You just have to really adapt it to your environment. Um, I will say that, that uh, KCS works in both of them. So don't water down the methodology or what you want to do because of the tool, because both of those tools will do what you want it to do. Um, and I found that to be the case in both. And you can unmute yourself now. We've given you that capability. So feel free to uh, put in chat, but feel free to also unmute yourself and ask questions if you'd like. James, did I miss any other than, I see there's a new one from John I can take on the metrics. Yeah, go ahead. I was just typing. Oh, you go ahead and take that one. I'm typing the answer to the, oh, there's one a couple of of entries above okay, it. great. So yeah, the, the, the good KCS to metrics to track with the KCS. I mean, I, I think personally, I would go to the adoption guide. I would go to the extra criteria of, of phase one, two, three. You know, phase four doesn't have an exit criteria anymore, which is good, uh, but, but one, two, and three do. And I would, I would assess yourself based upon 
those exit criteria. And that'll give you a marker of, of where you are. And then, you know, use that as a gateway to increase um, or change the metric as you, as you gate through. So if, if you can't meet the exit criteria of level one, start there. Uh, if you can't make it for, excuse me, phase one and, and phase two, the same thing. So I think, you know, the whole idea of KCS is that you've got to transform the organization. You got to introduce behavioral change. And so if you measure the same things as uh, in phase one, as you are in phase four, then you're way off the mark. So you have to adjust that as you go. And, and that's, that's, I think the key concept is that you have to be really assisted support focused in the beginning and building out solve loop tendencies and competencies. And then when you get to phase four, you introduce more of a holistic uh, view of support and your measurements should reflect that. We have one from Janine as far as how many KDEs do you have right now? How many KDEs? Uh, so we have um, identified 12 verticals uh, for our KDE, uh, for KDA program. And within each vertical, um, I think the total team is in the, the 30, 30 ish range. I think 35 is closer. Um, we've got some KDEs that, that cover a couple different verticals because they're not, you know, they're, if you took Venn diagrams of knowledge domains, there's lots of overlap. So a lot of times KDEs can float between the two, depending on how long they've been here, how expert they are, but it's a pretty healthy group. And they currently do all uh, kind of partial time, fractional time. Uh, we'd like to work up to an in-residence program where they get like a quarter or something like that to do. But, you know, remember we are a level three organization. So the KDA program started in earnest this fall when we exited uh, phase two in October. So we've got about 30 or so operating across 12 verticals. Um, and that's how we, we do it today. KDs per product application scope. Yeah. I, so I think, um, you know, we, 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 we looked at our knowledge base and the clusters that started to form and did some analysis. And it was pretty clear that, um, you know, we have a natural kind of product um, case routing, you know, specialty already introduced. And so it would make sense that the knowledge kind of started to cluster in those spaces. So I don't think, you know, it was uh, totally new to us on um, what uh, knowledge domains we, we built. Now, we do have a couple of them in there that maybe are, are cross domain. And so, you know, as stuff starts to build up, like we have um, you know, tooling and, and stuff like that, that I think um, you need to, you need to you think about from a knowledge domain uh, perspective, because we, we want people to think about efficiency and optimization in the sport engineer experience. So it's not purely on product lines, but that's definitely the basis of it. Contact centers plugged in and bought in. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't know if you're differentiating you know, content centers from engineering centers, uh, you know, I, I think in a complex system environment, sometimes you can have both maybe an engineering team or a, a call center. Um, and then if we don't do that, everybody is, um, you know, everybody who works the, the cases, uh, we consider a support engineer. So there isn't a differentiation from traditional call center stuff. I think, you know, call center environment, uh, obviously, that would maybe be low on the, lower on the technical scale. Um, you know, KCS works there just as well as as a as a high complex system environment. So I think the if you have them engaged in one part of your business and not the other, um, I would really look at the the practices and the motivations there. Um, maybe the metrics are different. Maybe the lack of investments there. Maybe there's more restraining forces. Um, but KCS should work in both, right? A call center environment that was you know high running case volume. Maybe there's more reuse, less create. Uh, whereas if you have a, a complex system environment with with higher skilled people and, and, and work, maybe there's more create opportunities and less reuse. But you know, overall, KCS should work in both places, no problem. All right, and we've timed out, but thank you so much, Ryan. This was Wonderful. extremely informative and uh, so many nuggets uh, for takeaways. And thanks to your team, they did an incredible job.